All right, so let's just break this down, what this plant is really doing. They are taking these coils, and there's about 30 to 50 of them arriving every day. They're staging them right here. I'm probably in the way. And then they're splitting them down the center. So they're splitting them like this, so they can roll them into tubes, squares, pipes, all different things, so they can then roll them, shape them, and then ship them out the other side. So that's what we're going to see now. <laughs> the camera's rolling. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, there, Detroit right? River, yeah. that's Peach Island, yeah. and then that's yeah. Belle Isle. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Yeah. It's a great Dick show. Avery, yeah. the, Dick man, the man that designed my boat. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have a pretty special morning. We were invited to come to Atlas II. Which so, is a division of Zuckelman Industries, and we were fortunate enough to be out to dinner with Barry Zuckelman a couple nights ago. Yes. And we got to talking about steel and all the steel and how it's made for the RV. He says, oh, well, we do 80% of the RV steel and tubing. He goes, and the hitches and the frame. Yeah, and the- We're like, what? And so Dexter cool. and Limper and everything. We thought, you want to come to the plant and go check it out? And we're like, yeah. yes. Yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> so come with us. All right, let's go inside and check it out. Hey Dale. Hey Dale, it's Mark. Being in a tubing plant is mesmerizing. At any one point, we could sit and watch as steel coils arrive at one end and finished products get stacked and sorted at the other. But to really appreciate what's happening here, let's start from where the coils arrive. Count those axles, 11, and there's a reason for that. Each one of these steel coils weighs 50,000 pounds. Now, if you know a bit about trucking, you know that the legal semi-truck weight is 80,000 pounds, but not in Michigan. Here, the legal limit on an 11 axle semi-truck is 164,000 pounds. It's clear that this is not your average forklift and watching it pick up a steel coil with ease and carefully placing it outside the building was so entertaining that we had to remind ourselves that the tour hadn't actually started. The first step is to split the coils into strips with a machine appropriately called the stripper. It looks pretty simple, but remember that these coils are a quarter inch thick. The most time consuming part of the process is the start and the end. Now that the coil has been separated into strips, they're carefully moved to the other side of the building and each new coil is prepared to be turned into a product. Today, Atlas Tube is making rectangle tubing. In order to be the most efficient, the second step is to weld the coils together and make a single 400 foot long piece.
punch that hole back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. That weld is considered a defect to our customers. So this laser right here picks that hole up. We identify that defect throughout the mill. It's automatically tied to scrap that piece. Now you're going to start to see some changes. As this strip of steel makes its way through the rollers, it slowly starts to get shaped into a tube. But perhaps the most fascinating part of the process, and my favorite part, is the weld that solidifies the connection. Almost like magic, the tube is transformed into a rectangle with just a few passes through these rollers, and just like that, it turns into a product. Now, it's carefully cut and positioned just right into a group of 25 pieces, secured, labeled, and stacked so it's ready to ship. Okay, so when we first got started on the tour, Dale said, we're gonna start on one side of the plant and then work our way through. He says, it'll make more sense as you go through it. Yes. Boy, was he right. Yes. All right, so when we were talking to Barry a couple days ago, he said like 80% of hitches and axles is made out of his plants, which are like, when he says the hitch, he means like the hitch receiver underneath the truck, which we just saw them scraping out on the, on the inside, right? Yes, and that's all the OEM stock side. Yeah, yeah. So those are stock, they're all the same size, they're going in the truck and they're going, yeah. they've all been specced out, it's very cool. Oh yeah, and then all the axles in there, I mean you could look up there and be like, all right, that's that's a, that's a an axle. Yeah. To an RV or to whatever the spec is, so yeah. it was a very fun tour and I hope you enjoyed seeing how it's made. Like, where, where is your axle, where is your hitch actually coming from and how is it made? Right here. Right here. <laughs> right here, folks. Good. Carson, are you done in here? Come on. Do you remember Nick Bruce and Nikki from the Homer Alaska episode when Carson caught the big infamous tagged fish? Yes. Nikki has been a friend since I think I was 15. Yes. When we met, right? Yes. Family friend. Family friend. And so her dad, Gus, who owns Ram's Horn restaurants and used to play for the Chicago Bears yes. and a Canadian team. Yes. Lives out here in Detroit. So Nikki grew up in Detroit. Yes. And so when Nikki found out we were coming to Detroit, she says, how about I fly out there and we can all and have Gus, we'll go out on the boat and you'll give a tour of Detroit from the water. And then that turned into a snowball. Your mom is here, your brother's here, our nephew, Little yes. David, is here. We call him Little David because he's not so little. Yeah. So um, we're gonna introduce you to the whole crew and we're gonna learn a thing or two about Detroit today. It's gonna be fun. So let's go out on the boat. Gus has a classic cruiser and the marina is about 35 minutes from here. So we're gonna go meet up with them and then we're gonna go out on the boat. And have a little lunch. Yeah. And we hope to share like it seems like all the buildings here have a story. There's yes. history. Mm -hmm. So he's going to share the history. He knows all the buildings on the water mm. and he's going to give us the scoop. So we're excited to share it with you. All right, let's pop on over to the boat. So are we on the right way? Um, I don't know. Did we do the right thing? T-Doc? T-Doc. Oh, T. Number and now 11? number 11. That's zero. One, two, three. Oh, T-11. Hello. Summer to remember. Yes. <laughs> so we have to introduce the crew. Hi, Chris. Hi. So we have Gus, our captain. We have Nikki, our very proud daughter of Gus. Yeah. And then we have little David, who is not so little. And my mom and my mom what? on the deck. Your mom's on the deck. Yeah, it was just David. And okay, and, and like Mark's beloved little brother, little David. Is yes. that good? Yes. Is no, that we'll good? Just wait, 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 wait. And we'll just our first mate, David. George, okay. and his wife, Barb. And yes, and our first mate, George. Are you ready, George? Look at this. Wait, they're best friends. Yeah. See, see yeah. That's friends. why I earned my master's Coast Guard captain license, so I could be the bilge rat <laughs> and the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> the and then 
Babs is also a Coast Guard captain. Really? And she's another mate, Augusta. So you have Give another? Do you have another one of those then? No. <laughs> I, I have oh, there's another one down there. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Only one. Oh, man. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> that was very good. Maybe, Gus, you could tell us about the boat. Uh, the boat is a 1971 Chris Craft Commander, second from last hall built in Holland, Michigan under the Chris Craft Corporation. And she's fully restored with the original motors in it. And uh, How many hours do you have on her? 3,000 hours. Wow. And they've been to New York City, Ottawa, uh, Montreal, Toronto, Chicago. We've done it all. You wow. Know, it, yeah, everything. trans Canal, Erie Barge Canal, Richelieu Canal. It's a lot of fun. Over the years, though. Yeah, you sure. Know. Yeah. And you bought her new? I uh, know she was uh, eight years old when I bought her. Okay, but still, you bought her? Yeah. Yeah, it was relatively brand new, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a club member here, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. and ever since I was a teenager, uh, we, our dad used to take us over to Jefferson Beach, which is up a little ways there. And we'd always get on Chris Crafts, you know, the triple cab, the triple oh, yes. D of the Woodies. Yes. And we'd always fight who's going to sit in the back so we'd get wet and that as kids. And ever since then, I've always wanted a Chris Craft. And then when this one became available, I got it. She fired up. One. Seriously, with that hat on. I can't. <laughs> While you were up front socializing. Well, I'll tell you about that in a second. I was with Gus getting all the info. Well, he on is our the king of the info. I he mean, is. He is the captain. Now, we passed the Bobla boat. Yes. You might have saw it. Yes. But that boat looked like this before the fire. And it's it was much much bigger that is so sad and then we also passed kid rock's house i heard yeah he wasn't out there darn it <laughs> you whistled but nothing nothing was going on <laughs> and then uh we also passed a couple infamous yacht clubs including the detroit yacht club um, which was formed way back in the 20s and of course what made it infamous is the fact that people were you know the rum running and the garwoods boat which they actually started making the garwoods Hello. racing boats the wood boats you know garwoods up in like yes! right here in this white building 1931. The Silver Fox of speedboat racing is 50 years old. At that age, most men yearn to take things easy, but not Gar Woods. Disregarding danger, Wood opens the front. He's known as the Silver Fox because of his racing skill. And Miss America Ninth is one of the fastest boats in the world. No way! Yeah, but back in the day, you know, with Prohibition and everything, you know, the, the you know, Detroit was hopping and the iron was going, and so the Detroit Yacht Club was like the premier yacht Oh, it's the place to be? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, wow. it's, very, it's all very interesting. I love the history of all the buildings. Yes. It's my favorite part. Behind it is uh, where the Seven Sisters used to be. It used to be a huge coal uh, electrical plant, and they demolished the, the Seven. That's just the wing left of the generation, and all the generation went to Japan and we watched it was an implosion and anywhere on Lake St. Clair that was your guide to get into the Detroit River back in the day. Yeah. Bridges there, that's what freighters could get in there and do their loading or unloading. And then behind there is the big Rouge plant, Ford Motor, where they make the F 150s and all that kind of stuff back in there. Just calmed out. What do you mean it calmed out?
It's conked out. <laughs> and that's the joy of a vintage boat. There's a pretty big current going. There's a buoy right oh, there. Yeah. I, I see it. Yeah, I got it. Did, did it just die? Yeah. But why is it? What's going on? So? That's, that's why we uh, We should go back. No, no, we're going to go. And no? Just hey, we're on. almost to Bruce's hospital. <laughs> what do you mean go back? get hooked up here I gotta get everything disassembled I was in a conversation with our neighbor over here who has a reflection 312 bunkhouse no 315 bunkhouse 315 reflection we had the 312 bunkhouse anyhow he and I were in a conversation with that I was asking him about his stabilizers and he was telling me these things are called GT stabilizers and they're mounted right there and it has this little knob right here that you unscrew and when you unscrew it and the stabilizers come up they just slide into each other. So that way you don't have to mess with them. You don't have to keep reattaching them. And then when you get the stabilizers, you just tighten those down. He's got one here, one there, and then he has another stabilizer underneath the steps right here and in the back. So I think there's six total. So I looked them up on Amazon and I believe, well, I'm gonna link them right here because I can't remember exactly how much they were, but they weren't exorbitant, especially for, how, for what they do, because we have gotten so many emails from people about how do you take out the rock and the rig? And you know, we use the X-Chox, but the X-Chox prevents the rig from shifting. It doesn't necessarily stop it from bouncing because you're still on the air of the tires and you're still on the leaf spring, and that's where all the bouncing comes from. That and of course the step. So anyway, I asked him about it and he said, oh, it is solid. So I wanted, to, I wanted to point those out because of how often we get that question. So I'll link it on our Amazon. I'll put it on probably like in the category of uh, for, the, for a travel trailer and you can check it out. And then if you get them, let me know. Give us, give us some feedback because obviously I don't have personal experience with this, but recommendation from this gentleman. And it in theory looks like it would really work out quite well. So now we've got a lot to do here to get packed up. We've got about an hour and then we're gonna head down to Sandusky and we're actually staying in the RV park connected to Cedar Point. 